Hey everybody and welcome to episode 2 of Freewheeling. I am Dr. Dave Nicholl. This is a show where you ask your veterinary business questions or leadership questions and I'll give you some form of answer that I have, I have found to be useful in my own career over the last 20 years. Uh, what's in it for you? Well, you get a copy of my new book called So Your Vet, Now What? And you can have it or you can give it to your new graduates or your recent graduates doesn't matter. Um, the choice is entirely up to you. That is 20 years of knowledge, took two years to write, distilled into 200 pages. Yours for free. All you've got to do is send me a question. Now today's question comes from Mark DVM78. Thank you very much, sir, for your question. Uh, Mark asks, how do you acquire practice and elevate the standards without firing all the staff? How indeed? He says, I never wanted to be that guy, but after a couple of practice acquisitions, I think I might need to be. All right, so this is a great question. And I'm sure anybody that has either bought a practice or taken over a practice or taken over a team has felt the pain of trying to get the team, steer the team to seeing life through your lens, okay? And really what this question boils down to is change. How do we manage change? And so you can apply this, I think. It's one of those, those concepts that can be applied at the macro or at the micro level. It's very fractal. And, and we are a, we're certainly a, a conservative industry. Uh, I think we're change resistant. I think that's been one of our strengths. But I think human beings by their very nature are change resistant because change uh, usually comes along with a healthy dose of anxiety, fear. And we just don't like that. So we don't like, it's not necessarily we don't like change, it's just we don't like the sensations and the emotions that go along with change. Because a lot of change often leads to good uh, and innovation uh, and things Im improving and progress. Um, but change is always fearful because of the unknown element. So I'm going to refer, Mark, to a little bit of, of theory, um, which I picked up from doing my, my management training. And that's back to uh, a bit of work done by a guy called Tuckman, way back, I think, it's probably the 60s, I could be wrong about that, it could be earlier. Um, anyway, Tuckman had this model for team development, and we had phases of team development, and really it's a change model for teams, okay? And so, and you may have heard of it, but all teams go through, when, you, when you'd make any change in a team, okay, they're all going to go through this particular process, and the process is uh, forming, and then we hit storming, and then the team hits norming, and then finally you hit performing, okay? Now, each of these phases has a distinct set of characteristics that, that the team are experiencing, and then there's a distinct set of things you as the leader can do to improve people's experience through that change and propel them along this change curve. And it looks like a graph. You start up, you get the change, and everyone's a bit excited, um, okay? And, and if you're taking over a practice, then you might go straight to anxiety for some people if they've had a good relationship with a previous boss you can imagine that they're going to go from forming straight to storming like immediately if they've had a bad boss so the practice wasn't a lot of fun as was the case in the first practice i ever acquired then there's probably going to be there'll be anxiety but there'll also be excitement um, hope for something better mixed in there and so they go through this sort of initial forming phase okay when the new normal uh, or the new proposition is experienced for the first time but pretty quickly teams then hit the trough of sorrow and they hit the storming phase uh, and that's when all of the anxieties are, are, are really unleashed and you start to get a real sense of um, really confusion and chaos within the team and then as we work through this phase we get to norming where people are starting to work out what it is they're meant to do in the new normal uh, and how they fit in there and become a bit more comfortable in that. And then finally, if things go really well, you can get to become a high performer. Now, a lot of veterinary practices never make it past storming. Okay, there is no guarantee that your team will always travel along this curve. In fact, without your leadership, I'll guarantee you that they'll get stuck. Um, possibly at storming and certainly at norming, if not there. Okay, so... What can you do as a leader in this theoretical model? And then how can we apply it to acquiring a practice? That's probably the most sensible way that my brain can think to come at this. So first up, 
um, when we're forming, the most important thing is to present a clear purpose and a vision for why the change is happening. Um, so describing what the change is and why it's happening. Okay. The second thing in storming, once we hit this trough of sorrow, it's all about emotion. And so it's, it's about allowing people to express that emotion, to listen to it so as they feel um, like their concerns are being addressed, their concerns are legitimate, and to know that their new leaders um, are understanding of what they're going through. Not necessarily that you're going to, to, to listen and, and act and do the things they want you to do, but just to know that they've been listened, okay? Um, in order to move from storming into norming, people need to know what the new normal looks like. So what are the new processes, protocols? What are the rules of the game? That needs to be explained and, and articulated. And then finally, we need to, once we hit that new normal or whatever the new functional normal is, if you want to get to a high performing team, i.e. one that delivers on its objectives, both performance uh, output wise and also behaviorally, um, then what needs to happen at that point is your leadership style is, is one of the most important things because you need to be then able to empower these people to, to step up and become leaders in their own right, if that makes sense. Okay. So Mark, let's go, let's think about acquiring a practice then. I think that's, that's, um, that's the thrust of your question. So let's go there. Um, when you acquire the practice, obviously you're, first job is to make sure people understand what's happening and why it's happening okay and the what's happening means you know you communicate openly you then you know the, the why is pretty obvious like the previous owner selling for some reason and you're the new owner but it's important you paint the vision of what the future looks like now that's where the part of your question is okay well how do you present that without it being you guys all suck and my vision's awesome. And so I think that is how you communicate it. So you present your vision, you present your purpose and what you want this practice to be about as the new owner. They're going to have all these fears and one of the fears and the, the stories they tell themselves here might be, as you've articulated, like, oh, that's your way of doing it. Are you saying our way sucks? Okay, so if they're having that, that's not true necessarily. Like, like if you bought a practice that's really performing poorly, then that may be very true. But if you acquired a practice actually was doing a decent job and you're, 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 you're taking a, a team that was working reasonably well in, then that may not be true. It, it may be that, that actually it's just a, a different way of doing things and actually you really respect the way they did it. And it may be you adopt some of the way and things that they did. So that all comes down to listening to their concerns and having empathy with those concerns uh, and working those concerns through. And so, you know, I, I, when I've acquired practices in the past, that means I'm going to sit down one-on-one -on -one with everybody and find out what's going on with them, um, what their concerns are, what their fears are, and then allow that to be expressed and then try and address those concerns if we can. Now, if their concern and their fear is that we're going to change a protocol or all, all of our protocols, um, and that is true, then I can't really say that that's not going to be the case um, but I have to bring them on the journey and have that conversation where they start to understand my reasons and my motivation for wanting to change it and I understand their reason for it not wanting to change and maybe they've got some good reasons so that's always where you invoke the seek first to understand rule one of the most important foundation rules of, of being a leader is listening not with a view just to listening, but to actually understand, deeply understand where they're coming from. Now, you will learn things, and you might learn that certain protocols are the way they are for good reasons. Or you might learn that actually these protocols are pretty old, and these guys are just scared of change because, and here's the thing, because they don't know how to do it the new way. And so they fear that they're not going to be good enough, and if they're not good enough, they're going to lose their jobs. So our job as a leader is to understand where they're coming from and then we can segue into step three, which is norming, and that is providing them with clear protocols and expectations, objectives we might call them, um, mentoring or training on how to do things in the new way so they feel a sense of certainty that they can perform the new job the way you want them to do it, and then mentoring so that they continue to develop their skills once you've laid out what the ground rules are. So then you get into norming 
and that would be a very good place for a lot of practice to even get to. And then finally, the last step in the journey in terms of performing is where, well, now they're starting to do a pretty good job. So how can you start making sure that they are completely accountable for their work and actually accountable for bringing the standard even higher than maybe you started to want it? You, know, you wanted it when you started to set out on the journey. And, and that then comes down to a change in leadership style again. So you're adapting your leadership style from being very telling everybody how it's going to be, listening and empathizing, teaching, training and setting the standards to now listening and asking questions and allowing your team because now they've got a much higher skill level and you trust them and they trust you. Now you can start to allow them a little bit of freedom to start exploring and, and going on their own um, journey to, to take ownership and accountability of the, the running of the practice. And so that is how I would approach it. Um, yeah, I think coming back to your one of the points you made there is, do you have to fire the whole team? Well, um, I think you're going to have the same problem. Um, just dressed up in a slightly different way. You, know, you fire the whole team, you're still going to have to go through this, this curve. You know, you're going to have to go out there and recruit a whole new team. You're going to have to teach them what the vision and the purpose is. You're going to have to do, you know, have them be all confused and crazy about, you know, how it's all completely chaotic because nobody has a clue how to do anything. And then finally you hit norming and performing if you do it right. So I don't think your job gets easier. In fact, in the current recruitment climate, Mark, I reckon it probably gets harder because how easy is it to hire clinical staff right now anywhere in the world? anywhere certainly uh, in the western world is super hard and so if you i think the 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 easy the the, the easy way to approach this or the, the way that we think is the easy way is just to say i'm going to clear everybody out and then i'll get in people i really want to work here and then we'll be all good and we just know that it's not true because we still hire people that actually were not great hires they still cause problems it still causes issues so I think bear in mind that change curve, but I think there's one other element I'd leave you with to think about, and that is if you end up, and this is what you don't get to choose when you buy a practice, you don't get to choose the team that you buy. And so you can work with people if you've got shared values. I, I believe that deeply. If you've got a bunch of people on your team that share your values, then you can take them down this curve and you're going to be okay. If, however, you've got people on your team that don't share your values and you've got a conflict there, then my friend, you do have a problem. And so as you're going through this pathway and you've, you've shown the vision, you've listened and empathized and legitimized feelings, you've set the standards of care, you've, you've made it clear what everyone's objectives are within their role, you've taught them, you've trained them, you've mentored the heck out of them, and they're still not coming to the party and taking ownership, well, that's when I think you, need, you move into a disciplinary performance management situation where, you know, that's your come to Jesus chat, really, you know, where you're saying, look, which team do you want to play for here? Because the old team doesn't exist. You are free to walk out of the doors and find a new team. But the way this team play is like that. And that's, that's a conversation I've had with people, you know, where you say, look, I want you on the team. You're, you add value. But you only add value if you're working with the team. If you're working against it, you're causing friction, you're causing problems for everybody, we can't have that. So make your choice. And I think that's a perfectly leg legitimate conversation that, that you must have. But I think if you go through this process, most of the people will come on the journey with you. Or even if they don't stay on it with you forever, they'll still find the experience pleasant and not as terrifying. And so I think that's what it's about. Set a vision, address fears, set your standards, hold people accountable and help them grow to become better versions of themselves. That's in a nutshell. I hope that was useful. Stay tuned to next week when we will have the next episode of Freewheeling. Uh, and don't forget to send your questions in uh, to hit me up on Instagram. So it's instagram.com forward slash at Dr. Dave Nickel, or you can send the question to Facebook. So it's facebook.com forward slash at Dr. Dave Nickel, or Twitter. It's just twitter.com, guess what? Forward slash at Dr. Dave Nickel. That's it for me. Have an awesome week, and I'll see you guys soon. Bye.